I think, what, what was it for? What did we go through as a family? What did, did all these young men and women go through? What, why? This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. The pandemic has made a lot of social and economic problems even worse. And one of those is food insecurity, including among military families. And now US troops have left Afghanistan after spending more than $2 trillion over the course of 20 years. So with all that money spent on the military, where's the funding for military families? And why is this problem of food insecurity so common? Your parents may have told you when you were a kid, there's people starving in insert developing or lower income country here to get you to eat your dinner so it didn't go to waste. The sad reality is there's people starving right here at home. Feeding America reports that overall, 42 million Americans are currently food insecure. That includes roughly 13 million children. Syracuse University research shows that before COVID, one in seven military families were food insecure, but now that number could be as high as one in three. There are a few factors playing into this. That includes low wages for lower ranked military members and high rates of unemployment among military spouses. Not surprising when you consider that that lifestyle involves frequent moves, expensive childcare, and having a partner who might have a pretty unpredictable schedule. Military spouses like Erica Tebbins know the struggle of finding work all too well. While her husband was active duty Navy, they moved to a new state where she had to get a new license to continue working as a teacher, which proved complicated. Here's what she told us. It didn't really seem worth it because I also would have had to pay for our son to be in daycare or have some sort of childcare while I was in school. It's really easy for America to exploit enlisted service members because we don't have a lot of other options for people if they want affordable education, if they want affordable health care, if they want, you know, uh, to get out of a like a dire financial situation. According to the Military Times, the most junior enlisted troops earn a base pay of about $21,000 per year, plus a possible housing allowance depending on their status. Military families are also often based in cities with a high cost of living, and a soldier's salary isn't always enough. The government offers food assistance programs like SNAP, but for service members who receive a housing allowance from the military, they are ineligible for the program. You also have to consider military culture, which makes some service members reluctant to ask for help. The whole like kind of brand around the military of just like being tough and having your together kind of, and being like a, a warrior, uh, it can feel really shameful to be like, oh yeah, I don't know, you know, we're having to take out payday loans or put groceries on the credit card and um, and things like that. It just, it's just, it's really hard to want to be honest about that. Still, many military families rely on food banks for their meals. The Armed Services YMCA, which has food banks on military bases across the country, says some of their locations have gone through serving 400 families a month to 400 families a week since the pandemic started. Erica's family didn't qualify for SNAP when they applied, but qualified for WIC, which is food assistance specifically for pregnant women, new mothers, and infants and children up to five while she was pregnant and through her son's first year of life. Of course, more food assistance through programs like that would help, but the problems these military families face run deeper than just that. They would have a better, safer, stronger military if thousands of their service members were not also stressed about how their loved ones at home were gonna pay the bills and put food on the table. In May, a bipartisan bill was introduced called the Military Hunger Prevention Act, which supports creating a basic needs allowance to provide food for military families. That bill was put forward by Democratic Senator Tammy Duckworth and Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn. We spoke with Senator Blackburn about her proposal and whether it could really make a difference for military families struggling to put food on the table. 
as a as a way to kind of lay the foundation here, how did Judah and Senator Duckworth come to um, introduce the Military Hunger Prevention Act? As we have worked on addressing some of the issues with substandard housing for our military families, what we became aware of was that there was also this issue that they had they were cut out of the benefits that they may need. So if they're in a substandard house and then they really need these benefits, uh, but the substandard house that they're wrestling with is keeping them from getting additional benefits that they need for their children, such as free lunch, such as um, food assistance programs. So we decided we would do something about it and we are. I'm curious to know, because these are lower earning uh, military personnel, um, is the bigger issue the lack of access to food assistance or uh, or maybe, you know, not giving our military personnel um, a, a higher salary or a salary to uh, a living wage, so to speak? When you look at hazard pay, uh, of course, that is a good thing. But during these times of redeployment, and the incredible number of deployments and the lack of dwell time, we just need to realize this is a very tedious and dangerous job and they should be co uh, compensated appropriately for what they are enduring every day. The way the formulary is positioned is the flaw and having this in the NDAA is a way to fix that flaw. Addressing some of these issues with on-base housing and substandard housing, that was a way to fix that flaw and that problem in the system. Addressing licensure so that spouses who are licensed in so many different uh, professions can take that licensure across state lines, whether it is, it is an accountant, or an esthetician, uh, whether it is a nurse or a teacher, that would allow them to immediately be able to go to work. This is all part of addressing barriers that hinder the work of the military family, and we should be showing our gratitude to them for their service. How exactly does the Military Hunger Prevention Act address the underreporting on, on this issue? When you remove that formulary, uh, remove this provision in the formulary, what you will do is allow them to say, this is where I fall in that line, thereby I can qualify. Right now, the way the formulary exists, that is a barrier in and of itself to people saying, I need additional help because they'll turn to family or friends to help them bridge this gap. And we want them to be able to work through this in the system and open that door of opportunity for more of our military families. What's next for the Military Hunger Prevention Act? It is moving through with the NDAA and we will see that process resume when we head back into session in September. Nearly 800,000 U.S. troops served in Afghanistan during America's longest war. Now, with U.S. troops out of Afghanistan, many military families are reflecting on the sacrifices of their loved ones and if any of this was even worth it. Newsy's Meg Hilling explains. I think, what, what was it for? What did we go through as a family? What did all these young men and women go through what? With U.S. troops now fully withdrawn from Afghanistan, many military families say they've been left to face painful questions regarding the sacrifice of their loved ones during the war. I want to know that Daniel's sacrifice was worth it. Elena Santilli is talking about her late stepson, Daniel. While serving as a Marine in Afghanistan in 2012, Daniel was severely injured in an explosion. A traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, and a host of other medical issues would haunt him for years before he passed away in his sleep in 2019. I can say he never really came home in some ways. Watching how brave he was and watching him struggle and 
watching his dad and just how it defined us as a family. I mean, it consumed us. Elena is a Dole Caregiver Fellow with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation a nonprofit that supports caregivers of injured or ill U.S. veterans. She says many service members and their families are grappling with the way the U.S. departed Afghanistan and what it means for their legacy. I'm not saying we shouldn't have left. I I'm not saying that. But the way that it was done was horrific. For me to see all of Daniel's friends struggling like they are right now, you know, it, and, and there's nothing you can do to make them feel better. Elena is not alone. Tara Plybon, also a Dole Caregiver Fellow, says the departure has been difficult for her and her husband Todd to watch. When people say they, they lost blood, sweat, and tears over there, he literally did. He literally lost almost his whole blood supply. Todd, a retired National Guardsman, was serving in Afghanistan in 2009 when his Humvee struck a roadside bomb. The explosion left Todd with a traumatic brain injury, a severely broken leg, PTSD, and permanent damage to his blood chemistry. He was a 39-year-old man when he got hurt. Now he's 50. His body's like an 80-year-old internally. At first, I thought I was just helping my husband out until he got better, and then everything would go back to normal. And it never went back to normal. Um, and that, that was hard to hard to accept. Around the country, advocacy organizations for service members and their families say they've been racing to meet a growing need for support as the withdrawal was finalized. We've been reassuring our families that their loved one's life was lived in service to this country and uh, that we honor that service and remember that life lived. Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, better known as TAPS, is witnessing a massive jump in calls from military families needing help to work through the emotions the withdrawal has brought on. For our families, we saw last year a little over 7,500 newly bereaved surviving families come to TAPS for care this year. Based on the number of family members who have come to us so far, we're on pace in 2021 to have over 9,000 newly bereaved military survivors come to us. Experts say families whose loved ones survived the war should watch for signs of distress, including nightmares or quick changing moods, negative thoughts or lack of interest in the things they used to enjoy, and feeling on edge, sometimes marked by being easily startled. Really, just access to professional services and professional resources is really the most important component. And, you know, as quickly as we can get them engaged in, in those programs is, is really critical. Meg Hilling, Newsy, Chicago. President Biden spoke today about the end of the so-called forever war. We've got to learn from our mistakes. To me, there are two that are paramount. First, we must set missions with clear, achievable goals, not ones we'll never reach. And second, we must stay clearly focused on the fundamental national security interest of the United States of America. But there are still questions as to what happens next. Here to talk to us a bit more about that is Newsy Sasha Ingber. Um, Sasha, what have we seen from the Taliban since U.S. troops officially left the country? It has largely been a celebratory day for them. We have seen that they have walked into the Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul, examining uh, equipment and weapons that the U.S. military left behind. They've been commemorating commanders who were killed by Afghan and U.S. forces, saying this is a moment of independence. Right after that last C-17 left, just right before midnight on August 31st, that deadline for the U.S. to leave. When the Taliban found out that the U.S. was indeed gone, they fired guns, what they called shots of joy. Uh, they said that citizens were perfectly happy with this. We've seen rallies today. We've seen mock funerals. And we've also seen footage that has been edited 
and put with very uh, victorious music, propaganda videos. So they are taking advantage of this day. And they're also strategically trying to take control of the country, form this government in a way that will allow them to immediately control people. Right now, the country is facing food shortages, cash shortages. And as part of the work that they want to do, they're looking for investments. And a Taliban spokesperson said today online that the head of the political unit in Doha for the Taliban met with China's ambassador to Qatar and that this ambassador offered humanitarian aid. So while this is going on, we also know that there are Americans and Afghan allies who still want to get out of the country. What is it that the U.S. is doing or what can they do to get them out? Well, yesterday, Secretary of State Antony Blinken made clear that this is now a diplomatic mission. Now, diplomats won't be based in Kabul or anywhere in Afghanistan because of the security threat. They're going to be operating out of Doha. And they're going to be trying to take those Americans, they say about 100 to 200 Americans left in the country, and our Afghan allies, try to get them out. So what kind of pressure can they apply, especially when they're not there? Well, they're saying that they can use diplomatic pressure, the threat of sanctions, economic pressure, that more than 100 countries are standing behind them to make sure that the Taliban honors its promise to allow Americans and Afghans to leave. It's unclear whether that operation will work. There's also unofficial efforts that I've learned about. Veterans, service members, NGOs who are working around the clock to try to get people out of the country. This isn't something new. They were doing this during the days of the evacuation mission, but they couldn't get their people to that airport. They couldn't get them through the gate. Sometimes they couldn't get them through the Taliban checkpoints. So these efforts are going to continue and they're continuing secretly. And I get the sense that no matter what happens, whether people get beaten, whether they uh, are um, having their paperwork destroyed, whether their phones are being scanned, uh, they will try to leave at a moment and time of their choosing, whether it's on the ground, uh, going to another country that surrounds Afghanistan, or by air. Um, there are people who have been leaving in the north in a city called Mazari Sharif. And um, there's going to be a relentless effort to get Afghans and Americans out. Thank you for that. Newsy, Sasha Ingber, we appreciate you. All right, we're going to take a quick break from the now concluded war in Afghanistan. When you're back, we'll take you out west where researchers are looking into a little understood aspect of wildfire damage. Mm -hmm. 